we thank God so much for the six days of the week and even allowing us to be the seventh day of uh, the week. This is the second Sabbath of this month and we are so much glad to be in it. The Bible says we need to rejoice and to be glad on this day. This is the day that the Lord has blessed and they ordained it that we may worship him in truth and also in spirit. I want us to have a study tonight <clears throat> and it is a continuation of the series that we have been looking at and that is the series of righteousness by faith. Today we are also going to look at a very important subject as far as righteousness by faith is concerned. And in relation to Christ's second coming, this is an experience that is needed of us before Christ comes. So I feel in my heart that this subject and this topic is so much important. Without it, I'm convinced that friends, we are not going to attain to the perfection that God is calling us to attain. Without much ado, I want us to pray and then to begin our study tonight. Let us believe even as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. We love you. We appreciate your love so much to our lives, even allowing us to be in this holy house of the Sabbath. We plead for forgiveness of all our sins. And even as we study your word tonight, may it touch our lives. As we all the beauty of your Son, Jesus Christ, may it draw us closer unto you that our hearts may be cleansed. Help us to overcome sin and to live a righteous life in this final house of this earth history. It's our sincere prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Beloved, Christ is coming. And those who are living in this final house of this earth history, all the signs in the world are clearly indicating to us that Christ is even at the door. So as we look at uh, this subject of today, I wanted us to begin it from a point where we are reminding ourselves of the preparation that is needed and required of us before the second coming of Christ. And that the fact that Christ is coming should uh, trouble our hearts that we do self-examination day by day. We need not to take it for granted that we are alive. We are told that our probation is about to close Mercy that has been pleading for years will soon cease to plead and will soon cease to invite us to come to God. So allow me to remind us of the fact that people have thought to be a fable and uh, they have doubted it. And that fact is that Christ is coming to take the elect home. In the book Testimonies, Volume 2, page 355, the pen of inspiration says, We believe without a doubt that Christ is soon coming. This is not a fable to us. It is a reality. So it is a reality that Christ is coming. We have no doubt Neither have we had a doubt for years that the doctrines we hold, we hold today are present truth and that we are nearing the judgment. Reading the blue words, it says, When he comes, he is not to cleanse us of our sins, to remove from us the defects in our characters, 
or to cure us of the infirmities of our tempers and disposition. We have been told that we need to believe without a doubt that Christ is soon coming. And it is a reality and not a fable. With that in mind, what you are also reminded is that when Christ comes, he is not coming to cleanse us. He is not coming to die for us on the tree of Calvary, but he is coming to execute judgment. That he is not coming to remove from us the defects in our characters or to cure us of the infirmities of our tempers and dispositions. He is coming to take those who are prepared home. What are we to do as we wait for the second coming of Christ? It continues to say, I'll uh, read the red words and the blue words. It says, no work will then be done for them to remove their defects and give them holy characters. So at the second coming of Christ, we don't expect to be cleansed from our sins. We don't expect that at that point is when we now strive and struggle to overcome sin and to be victors. This is the time that God has granted unto us to overcome. And we need to overcome sin now before the second coming of Christ. It continues to say, the refiner does not then sit to pursue his refining process and remove their sins and their corruption. That will not be the appropriate time for Christ to refine us. It will not be the right time for us to be taken to the furnace, to be tried as gold is tried, so that we can come out refined and pure. Now is the time to prepare that character. Tends by saying, this is all to be done in these hours of probation. It is now that this work is to be accomplished for us. Christ is doing a greater work in the most holy place. And soon the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. We are told when the sanctuary is clean, God is also expecting people who are clean to be taken home. And that work is about to end. So we are reminded that the work of preparing a character that is going to fit us for eternity, the work of overcoming sin is now in these hours of probation. That before probation closes, before Michael stands up, before Christ finishes his work in the most holy place, we need to conquer sin in this life before our probation closes. This is all to be done in these hours of probation, that it is now that this work of overcoming sin is to be accomplished in our lives. It is time to overcome. In Testimonies, William 5, page 215, paragraph 4, it reminds us of this fact again. It says, It is now that we must keep ourselves and our children unspotted from the world, that it is now for us to overcome sin. It is now that we must wash our robes of characters and make them white in the blood of of the Lamb. It is now that we must overcome pride, passion, and spiritual slothfulness. It is now that we must awake and make determined efforts for symmetry of character. The series of quotations that we have read are just reminding us of the second coming of Christ and the preparation that is required of us. That after we have believed without a doubt that the coming of Christ is soon 
and it is a reality and not a fable, God calls us to prepare a character. As we prepare character, there is also a great work that God is calling us to understand and to know. That is the work of overcoming sin. I know many will reach a point of asking themselves, how then will I overcome sin? Is it possible to live an upright, to live a righteous life now? Is it really possible to be overcomers of sin at all times? The answer is yes. And that's why Christ has led for us an, an example of living a righteous life, living a victorious life, living a life where we overcome sin at all times. So we are going to look at our pattern man, one who also lived in this world when there was sin. And we are going to look at the life of Christ, how he lived and how he conquered sin. That is the experience that we also need as God's people. If you look at Revelation chapter 3, verses number 21, after God has given us a counsel, the counsel of a true witness to the church of the Laodiceans, there is a promise that Christ is giving his church that we need to understand and to realize that they should also be exemplified in our lives before the close of probation. Revelation 3.21, this is the promise that Christ is giving us and is speaking directly to us today. That to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me on my throne. Then he says, even as I also overcame, and I am set down with my Father on his throne. Christ is calling for victory. He is calling us to overcome sin. Is when we are going to find an opportunity to sit with him on his throne. And he is saying, even as he also overcame. So he once overcame sin in this life. And he will want us to overcome even as he overcame. Let us briefly examine the life of Christ and the record that is given us of the life that Christ lived while he was upon this world. Right from 4 BC to 31 AD, Christ lived in this world. We want to look at Christ's life and the record that we are given of his life when he was upon this earth. We are told he used to be our pattern man. What are we to know about the life that Christ lived? What record are we given from God's word? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses number 21, talking about Christ, he says, For he, that is Christ, no, for he, that is God, hath made him, that him is Christ, to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? That we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So Christ was made to be sin for us. Yet he knew no sin. There was nothing found in Christ that Satan could hold on and say that Christ was his. So he overcame Satan in all the days of his life upon this earth. That is the one whom we are called to emulate. We are called to follow his footsteps that we may overcome sin even as you overcame sin. We are still looking at the record that we are given of Christ. 
he knew no sin. He never committed sin. To mean he overcame. And his overcoming should be our overcoming. His victory should also be seen as our victory and should be our victory as well. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For even to this were he called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that he should follow his steps. He was an erring example to us. Someone who can be emulated and copied. For there was no fault in him. He knew no sin. Verse 22 confirms to us, says, Who committed no sin? Neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. So there was no sin found in Christ when he was upon this heart. And this overcoming should be our overcoming. Desire of Ages, page 123, paragraph number 3, has this powerful words for us. It says, There was in him nothing that responded to Satan's sophistry. He did not consent to sin. Not even by a thought did he yield to temptation. So it may be with us. That's why Christ is saying, those who are going to overcome will he grant to sit with him on his throne, even as he overcame. So the same way that he overcame Satan, and uh, the record is given to us that he did not consent to sin. That even with a thought, Christ did not yield to Satan's temptation. She overcame sin at all times. He never fell into Satan's temptation. He was victorious in all things. And in all his life, he lived a sinless life. We are told, so it may be with us. But that is the life that God calls us to live if we are going to be fitted for eternity. That the work of overcoming, we have been told, should be in these hours of probation. That before probation closes, we need to ensure that we overcome every sin. And for us to overcome sin, we are told we need to follow the footsteps of our unerring pattern man, who is Christ Jesus. And it's even sharing and directing us to his life that as he overcame so are we also to overcome that we need to reach to a point where we do not consent to sin we do not yield by even our thoughts to satan's temptation the one whom we have been given to follow his footsteps is christ jesus it continues to confirm in great controversy page 623 that Satan could find nothing in the Son of God that would enable him to gain the victory. He had kept his father's commandments, and there was no sin in him that Satan could use to his advantage. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of of trouble that we must reach that condition of sinlessness that point of becoming victors and victorious over sin at all time but we are only to follow the footsteps of Christ for us to overcome sin what is it that God is directing us to look at what we are considering here is called the humanity of Christ, the humanity of the Son of God. For many will reason and say that 
Christ did not take the sinful flesh. He did not take the sinful mind. We want to look at the humanity of Christ. Because we have been told that we are to follow him. So if he was God upon this earth, how will we follow his footsteps of becoming victorious over sin and yet he was different from who we are? So what we are looking at today is the humanity of Christ Jesus. For him to be our pattern man, we need to consider his humanity. Did he take the body the same as mine and yours? Was he also beset by sin as we are often beset by sin and trials? And if he overcame, and yet he also partook of this same sinful nature and this sinful flesh that you and me have, then we are not going to have an excuse. That is what we want to look at briefly and then we pray. In Selected Messages, Book 1, page 244, a powerful quotation, it says, The humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. That what should be our study in these dangerous times and these perilous times of this earth history is the humanity of the Son of God. And as we look at the humanity of Christ Jesus, God is reminding us that our probation is about to close. We are to overcome sin before it is forever too late. Looking at the humanity of Christ Jesus, Paul has this record to share with us in the book of Romans chapter 8 verses number 3, touching about the humanity of Christ Jesus. He says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So Christ coming to die for us, he took a sinful flesh that you and me have today, and yet he was still victorious. So this is a subject that brings us face to face with the reality. And uh, we will not have an excuse or a hook to hang our doubts of living a life of sin. For Christ also partook of this sinful flesh. And the quotation that we want to read confirms to us that Christ took the nature of Adam after fall. And uh, not immediately after Adam had, had, had fallen into sin. But after 4,000 years, after sin had ruined the human life for nearly 4,000 years, is when Christ now took of that nature and still emerged victorious over sin. No excuse for God's children who will continually live in sin. Read this with me in Desire of Ages, page 48, paragraph number 6 confirms this fact by saying it will have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature even when Adam stood in his innocence in heaven. So it will not be possible for us now to overcome. Suppose Christ could have taken the nature of Adam before fall when Adam was still holy and perfect and upright in the sight of God. It continues by saying, But Jesus accepted humanity 
when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Not just after Adam's fall, but it was after 4,000 years when uh, the race has been weakened by sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. What these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such hereditary to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us the example of a sinless life. So he set for us a sure pattern that each and every one of us need to follow for us to overcome sin. And uh, with this in mind, it is therefore true that, beloved, for us to inherit eternity, we need also to be overcomers. And he is inviting us to overcome sin even as he overcame sin. Let us continue looking at the humanity of Christ, that Christ was a real man. He had the same nature as you have but he did not consent to sin. Notice what the word of God continues to explain about this subject. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 through 8, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So the mind of Christ should be ours. The mind that does not consent to sin should be us. What is that mind? Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. He was a real man. Just as you and me are, Christ took of that nature. And the record given us is that he was sinless, he lived a victorious life. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 through 17 continues to confirm this fact that Christ was a, a real man. He took of that same sinful nature, but not sinful mind. Sinful nature of Adam after sin had weakened the human family for 4,000 years. It says, Since then the children are partakers of the flesh and blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil. So we are told he also, he also himself likewise took part of that same nature of man and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Verily, he took not on him the nature of angels. So Christ did not even take the nature of angels. But he took on him the seed of Abraham. Abraham came to exist after sin and ruined the human family. So Adam is a descendant of uh, Abraham is a descendant of Adam. And he's coming to exist after sin had ruined and has weakened the human family. So when he took of the seed of Abraham, he took of a sinful nature. So it will be erroneous if we say that Christ was, was divine and was 100% God when he was upon this earth, and that's why he never overcame sin. That will be a great lie. And with that, he cannot be our pattern man. For him to be our pattern man, he has to be the same as we are. And I have said, and I'm still repeating this, that Christ partook of sinful nature, but not the sinful man, mind or the carnal mind of the human family. 
So he chose to do the will of God at all times. And he never consented to sin. Yes, he partook of the sinful nature, but not the carnal mind. That is our choice, to entertain carnality in us. Wherefore, verse 17, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, that Christ was a real man. We confirm this fact. Christ was a real man. No excuse for sin. In that same book, Selected Messages, book 1, page 1, page 244, the paragraph that we read initially, we are now continuing, it says, Christ was a real man. He gave proof of his humility in becoming a man. Yet he was God in the flesh. When we approach the subject of the humanity of the Son of God, we will do well to heed the words spoken by Christ to Moses at the mount of the burning bush. The final black word says, And the study of the incarnation of Christ is a fruitful field which will repay the searcher who digs deep for hidden truth. So Christ was a real man. Selected Messages, Book 3, page 136, paragraph number 3. Christ overcame the temptations of Satan as a man. Every man may overcome as Christ overcame. And that's why he's telling us in uh, Revelation chapter 3 verse 21 that unto him who shall overcome sin will he grant to sit with him on his throne even as he overcame. So we are told every man may also overcome sin as Christ also overcame. He humbled himself for us. He was tempted in all points like as we are. He redeemed Adam's disgraceful failure and fall and was conqueror, thus testifying to all the unfallen worlds and to fallen humanity that man could keep the commandments of God through the divine power. Amen granted to him of heaven. So heaven is ready to impart to us and to bestow to the human family the divine power that can help and lead us to live a victorious life as it is seen in the life of Christ. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, talking about the life of Christ, and the temptations that he was subjected to, it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So as he was tested and tempted by the devil, that is the same way that we are also tempted. And he was tempted in all points, yet he came out victorious and overcame. That is the life that we are to copy for us also to overcome. Our I calling 48 paragraph 2. Christ overcoming and obedience is that of a true human being. In our conclusions, we may make many mistakes because of our erroneous views of the human nature of our Lord. That people do not understand the human nature of Christ. When we give to his human nature a power that is not possible for man to have in his conflicts with Satan, we destroy the completeness of his humanity. 
is imputed grace and power he gives to all who receive him by faith. So if we'll come to a point of saying Christ exercised some powers that we cannot exercise, then he is different from us. To me, he is a liar when he says we can overcome as he overcame. That's why God will want us to approach this subject with much wisdom from above, that at the end we don't have hooks to hang our doubts of not overcoming sin. The obedience of Christ to his Father was the same obedience that is required of man. Man cannot overcome Satan's temptations without divine power to combine with his instrumentality. So with Jesus Christ, he could lay hold of divine power. He came not to our world to give the obedience of a lesser God to a greater, but as a man to obey God's holy law. And in this way he is our example. So when he is our example, he is a true and real example. Not coming to display what a lesser God can do to a greater God, but coming to reveal to us obedience that man can also render to God if he is in full surrender to the divine will. The Lord Jesus came to our world not to reveal what a God could do, but what a man could do through faith in God's power to help in every emergency. So Christ came to reveal what man can do through the power of God. So Christ surrendered his life to God fully and with this life, we can learn the perfect work of the angels. So we can learn ministration of angels through the life of Christ. All those great miracles that he did, he did through the power of God. Not him being a lesser God doing the miracles upon this heart. That's why we are told if Christ raised the dead, the apostles also raised the dead. So no difference. That life can also be lived by us. Man is through faith to be a partaker of the divine nature and to overcome every temptation wherewith he is beset. Christ is soon coming. And since he is soon to come, we are to overcome sin. No excuse. We are also going to look at what could Christ do for him to overcome sin? And I know he lived in subjection to the will of God. He surrendered his life fully to God. And God will not forsake him even for a moment. He lived a victorious life. Desire of Ages, page 664, says, The Savior was deeply anxious for his disciples, for his disciples to understand for what purpose his divinity was united to humanity. He came to the world to display the glory of God, that man might be uplifted by its restoring power. God was manifested in him that he might be manifested in them. Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him is perfect humanity. No qualities. He exercised no powers that we cannot exercise through faith in him. So God is inviting us also to be overcomers, that we may overcome as his son overcame sin. What was the secret behind Christ overcoming? In John chapter 8 verse 29, the Bible says, And he that sent me is with me. For the Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. So if we delight to do God's will, 
he will not leave us even for a moment. We will be with him through his angels. His angels will be guiding us and will be guarding us. Satan will not find a foothold upon our lives that he may lay his snares and we fall into his trap and get lost. But if we are going to subject our lives to God and live in conformity to his divine will, we are going to be overcomers. The secret, Christ has rendered his will to God. And I believe in our series we looked at how to surrender. That is the secret of overcoming sin. And this is the secret that Christ also employed to overcome sin. It says in John chapter 5 verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear I judge and my judgment is just because... I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father who has sent me. So he surrendered his will to the will of God. And that is humanity combining with the divinity and divinity prevailing victory over sin. Notice what the Sire of Ages says about the secret of Christ overcoming. The Sire of Ages, page 336, paragraph 1. When Jesus was awakened to meet the storm, you remember that account in the sea? After the disciples had employed all that they had, they had cast everything to the sea. But the storm was still great that they were not at peace. But Christ was found in the hinder of the ship with a perfect peace reigning in the heart. And when he was awoken, we are told that in his countenance revealed no trace of fear or anxiety or anything like stress, but he was in perfect peace. Why? When Jesus was awakened to meet the storm, he was in perfect peace. There was no trace of fear in word or look, for no fear was in his heart. But he rested not in the position of, a, of a, an almighty power. He was not as a lesser God, now having a perfect peace. But we are told it was not as the master of the earth and sea and sky that he reposed in quiet. That power he had laid down. And he says, I can of mine own self do nothing. That is John chapter 5, verse number 30. The secret is that he trusted in the Father's might. It was in faith. Righteousness is by faith, faith in God's love and care that Jesus rested and the power of the word which stilled the storm was the power of God. We say amen. So when people will say Christ manifested the power of a lesser God in some instances, we are told that is erroneous. That is a view that need not to be entertained. For Christ trusted in the Father's might and the power of the word that stilled the storm was the power of God. As we pray, Christ lived a life of power, a life of victory over sin. He rested upon God, and what made him to rest upon God at all times, Minister of Healing, page 51, records by saying, The Savior's life on earth was a life of communion with nature and with God. In this communion, communion with nature and with God, he revealed for us the secret of a life of power. If you desire to live a life of power, to be an overcomer, as Christ also overcame sin, we need to live a life of power. Christ took the sinful flesh. He never took the sinful mind, the carnal mind, but took of the sinful flesh. He was a real man. He lived a life without sin because he trusted upon God. He yielded his will to the will of God. And we read that 
when we are going to surrender our will to God, when our, the will of man is to cooperate with the will of God, it will become omnipotent. And God is going to give us victory over sin. The humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. And this chain that binds us to God, binds us to Christ, should be our study that Christ was a real man and yet he overcame sin. May God also help us that as we witness these final events that are showing us that Christ coming is soon and imminent, we may surrender our lives to God, that we may also live a life of power. May our God bless us, and as we continue to contemplate on this subject, may God give us a deep understanding that we may learn how to surrender our lives to God, that we may live the very life of Christ upon this earth within this short time that we have. God bless us even as we pray. Loving God, we thank you so much. Thank you so much for leading us to study our unerring pattern man, Christ Jesus, one whose record is given to us that he did not consent to sin. He never yielded even by a thought to the temptations of the enemy. This is the life that you are calling us to live, and yet we fall each and every day because we choose to entertain the carnal mind. Help us to surrender, dear Father, for our time in this world is soon to end. While mercy still lingers, help us to make a thorough preparation for eternity. Is our prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you even as you have a blessed Sabbath.